our speaker for today is Bernie Finkel. Bernie is a legacy steward and in the past has served on the Conservancy Board of Directors. He has been instrumental in helping create the Conservancy Steward Program, which currently has a network of over 660 volunteers, plus our incoming stewards in training. Bernie loves the desert, has created a self-taught expert, has become a self-taught expert on ethnobotany and the medicinal use of the plants of the Sonoran Desert. He has shared his knowledge and love of this unique area with numerous groups, both on and off the trail. I'm certainly looking forward to the new Legacy Walkabout program where Bernie's informative and entertaining presentation will come to life on December 21st at Brown's Ranch. Bernie, I have to really be honest with you. I had to look up what ethnobotany was. Um, so I'll give the definition so maybe other people aren't from that as familiar either. It says the scientific study of the traditional knowledge and customs of a people concerning plants, their medical and religious and other uses. I also noticed, as this is as a disclaimer, uh, noticed from your Facebook post from Brown's Ranch regarding the most poisonous plant in the preserve uh, called the sacred datura. And you can correct me in a second if I'm wrong. So everybody be careful what you touch and what you ingest out here in the preserve. Um, remember to put your hours in and submit your questions through the chat. Uh, looking forward to today's presentation. Uh, Bernie, it's all yours. Nice You're to You're stealing you. my presentation, Steve, but I thank you anyway. What did I uh, do? You stole it. I'm you stole sorry. it. That's okay. No problemos. Look, we'll be talking about plants, and basically what we was talking about is what makes a plant a medicinal plant. So we're going to mix in a little history, a little botany, take a virtual stroll through the preserve and look at some medicinal plants, the good, the bad, the ugly. Can Let's see, I you don't have my presentation up there, do you? You have to share it. Are you going to share it? Well, there it is. Got it? Okay. Got it. Anybody's? Is it there? Yes, yeah. you have to put it in slideshow. Oh, God. Are we up at top on the slideshow. Keep going. A little more. Hold on. Uh -huh. oh. Any luck? No, you have to go up to the top and put it to slideshow. With your mouse oh, or your yeah, I got it. All right. You got it right. Here we go. Slideshow. How are we doing? Perfect. Excellent. Nothing's perfect, but it, I, I see the same thing that you do, so we must be doing well. So let's talk about the history of medicinal plants. Man has always had the need to try to cure, mitigate pain and disease, even from the beginning. Uh, basically, the quest of, for this knowledge was basically in his pursuit for food. Utilizing trial and error, he would basically determine whether or not plants were edible or not edible. They were injurious to his health, to his welfare. And through this trial and error basis, he was able to identify to make notations and pass on genera generationally the benefits of his new discoveries. We can start this history going back at least 60,000 years to a burial site in Iraq with Neanderthal man. Paleobotanists discovered the pollen of eight medicinal plants that had been buried with him. The same Neanderthal group in different locations in Belgium and Spain, they discovered that through analysis, DNA analysis of his plaque on his teeth, they were able to determine that uh, he had chewed on popular bark, which contained the an an analgesic, uh, the painkiller salicylic acid, which in essence is aspirin, and traces of appetite suppressants found in yarrow and chamomile. 
So the importance of plants in medicine. Currently right now in the world, about 25% of all our prescription drugs come directly or from derivatives of plants. And four out of five people around the world rely on plants for their primary health care. Now, prior to World War II and the discovery of how to mass produce penicillin, that number in this country was 80% that were derivatives and came directly from plants. At least 3 billion people in this world rely on plants for their major primary health care, countries like China, India, Nigeria, and Mexico. So primary plant compounds, what are they? Well, they're compounds needed for the plant to survive. Incidentally, those same compounds are what we need to survive. So in that particular instance, plants and humans are basically the same. Their needs are the same. In their evolutionary process, plants decided not to be able to be ambulatory. They decided to put their roots into the ground and basically because of that, they eliminated the ability to flee from predators or were unable to go out and get themselves a mate. So the plant had to produce what we call secondary plant compounds, and they're not absolutely required for their survival, but they protect the plant from animals, insects, plants, pathogens, etc. And they aid in the reproduction via pollination, uh, attracting their pollinators so they, they can procreate. And basically, they, they also help re revitalize the plant. Think serotonin, think endorphins in the case of humans. So we have four main basic classes of secondary plant compounds, alkaloids, glycosides, polyphenols and terpenes. Now, when we deal with alkaloids, with, this is probably the secondary uh, com plant compound that is really the, mo the one that's mostly used for medicine. And the typical profile of alkaloids is number one, they contain nitrogen. They're usually alkaline. They have a, a bitter taste. And they have a, a, they're very, they stimulate the central nervous system, and they often end in the suffix I N E. Now, some of your favorite alkaloids might be, as we talk about stimulants, and I don't know which one would be the most important to you, but the some stimulants would be cocaine, caffeine, in depressants, you would find morphine and codeine. Uh, hallucinogens would be mescaline and poisons, nicotine and strychnine, or nine, or whichever way you want to pronounce it. The second most important as a medicinal unit would be uh, glycosides, and glycosides having a sugar molecule attached to the active compound. And there are three types of glycosides, cyanogenetic, cardioactive, and saponins. <laughs> Cyogenic glycosides uh, basically uh, release HCN, hydrogen cyanide, into the digestive system. Now, thankfully, the human body does have some compounds that will mitigate the, the toxic impact of that, convert it into vitamin B12, and flush the rest out in your urine. But unfortunately, if you have large quantities, there are not enough of these compounds uh, to take care of that. And uh, obviously, there's a fatality involved if you take too much of uh, cyanides. Uh, examples of this would be the cassava root, which you see pictured there, also known as yucca with one C and manioc, a very important plant throughout the world. Uh, Lima beans, seeds, and pits of the rose family. Cardioactive glycosides are a little different. They obviously cardio, they affect the heart. 
And what they do is they increase the input of the force causing greater blood pressure on the heart and causing the blood to go into the system at a greater force. Uh, they also are a diuretic and they have a steroid uh, molecule attached to their uh, molecules. Uh, example of that would be lily of the valley, oleander, something to take note of. If you have a dog or pet around your area where you have oleander, and foxglove, which is dioxin and digi digitoxin, which is also known as digitalis for people who have heart conditions. Saponins are the next category, and they're phytochemicals that possess detergent qualities when mixed with water or agitated in water. They basically help reduce <clears throat> bad cholesterol, LDL. They enhance the autoimmune system. Uh, the, the polysterol compounds that are contained within them are anti-inflammatory, and they are found in legumes. The yucca plant, as you see the soap tree yucca there in the picture, tomatoes and potatoes. Now, flavonoids are a very important uh, part of, of compounds that are a, beneficial to your, your health. Uh, they are water-soluble. Water-soluble, as opposed to fat-soluble, indicates that water-soluble is that the, the, the material is absorbed into your body and within 24 hours is out of your body. Fat-soluble is when the nutrient is absorbed in there, into the fat cells, and stays there and can be a problem if uh, you take too much of that particular uh, phytochemical or chemical and it become, can become toxic. So they, uh, polyphenol flavonoids are also responsible for the vivid coloring of the fruits and vegetables. And they are very powerful antioxidants with anti-inflammatory and immune system benefits. And then some of our, one of our favorite uh, phytochemicals will be tannins, which are antimicrobial and they basically inhibit the growth of fungi, yeast, bacteria, and, vitus, uh, and viruses, creating a, uh, a barrier of contamination, which keeps all the, all the various fungi and, and bacteria away from uh, healthy materials. Okay, they're found in red wine, chocolate, and black tea, and they help reduce high blood pressure and serum lipid levels, which are basically the bad cholesterol. Terpenes are uh, aromatic hydrocarbons used for defense and attracting pollinators. They are antimicrobial and have insectial properties. The essential oils from these terpenes or contain the essence of the plant fragrance and their use in aromatherapy goes back as far as the Egyptians around 3500 BC. If you look in the picture, you will see a picture of the largest plant in the world. It's called the corpse plant. It's a member of the Arum family, which is the lily family. Uh, the person, the little boy in front holding his nose is not getting ready to jump into the pool. Uh, the plant emits a tremendously disgusting flesh, decaying flesh smell, which obviously is there to attract a pollinator. You guys have any idea what they are? Well, I, I basically, what is uh, the pollinators that are attracted to decaying flesh or flies? And that is the role that the terpenes are playing in that particular case. In another plant like the lemongrass from Southeast in Asia, which is used in Thai cooking and things like that, one of the things that they have as part of their phytochemistry is something called citronella, which I think we're uh, familiar with. Uh, and citronella is an insect repellent. So that basically helps repel uh, invaders from that particular grass that would be injurious to their health. Uh, phytonutrients and basically as preventive medicine is important. Uh, plants will give us vitamins, minerals, and they also give us a, 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 an array of chemicals called antioxidants. Okay, we'll 
spent before we take our little trip into the berserk, let's spend a little time and, and talk about how antioxidants work. But before we do that, let's talk about free radicals, because that's the thing that is destructive to your body or any body that was in existence hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years ago. Free radicals basically are molecules that have unpaired electrons. They lose them over a period of time or they're constantly losing them, actually. Uh, if molecules continue to lose unpaired electrons, they start a chain reaction which causes the cell to disintegrate and everything else just keeps going downhill fast. Uh, so what we need to stop this, because if this continues, we basically have the body breaking down, leading to cancer, heart attacks, and a, a, and a myriad of other uh, maladies that humans suffer when this happens. Enter antioxidants. Now, antioxidants are basically molecules that contribute without any loss to their uh, ability to survive. They contribute electrons. And basically, this is an ongoing thing that lasts forever and ever and ever, as long as the body is still surviving. So it is important that we have antioxidants in our body. And because it, you have an antioxidant, it doesn't mean that it's going to cure you. It will basically be will take care of free radicals that it only can take care of. So the, having a spectrum of antioxidants or a balanced diet basically keeps you from going downhill fast. Okay, so I, I, I thought I, I brought that into it because I think the, the, the concept of preventive medicine, really utilizing plants, which is the prime providers of that, is, is very important to understanding the importance of plants in the medicinal process. Okay, we're ready to take a hike, a virtual hike through the preserve. I, I know most of you have read uh, Marianne Jensen's book on flowers and plants in, in, uh, in the Sonoran Desert or in our preserve, actually. Uh, I have two, and uh, one, I think a couple of years ago when I had nothing to do, I sort of perused through the book and sort of picked out of all the plants, about 60 that contributed to the uh, medicinal uh, aspects of uh, plants in the preserve. So we know there's a lot of opportunities for the Native Americans in this area to partake in that. So if, if, we, uh, if I could, I'd just like to just take a little walk and talk about approximately 13 plants that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And so let us try and get that one uh, done without any technical difficulties, hopefully. Uh, the most important medicinal plant that was used in, in, in the hood, in this neighborhood, uh, by the Native Americans was a creosote bush. Uh, the creosote bush is a, is a great plant to talk about because it's the most uh, drought tolerant plant in the desert. See one that lives? Uh, time out. <laughs> if, if technology will be the death of me. Anyway, it is, <laughs> it is, it is the most uh, prolific medicinal plant that is out there. It was used in, by many of the Native Americans in the Southwest. And without getting involved in the plant itself, the most important part is what is the chemical compounds that are on their little microphylums. Uh, if I, uh, the little leaves, in other words. Uh, there's about a hundred compound, chemical compounds on them. One of them is a chemical compound called NDGA, Norde Diagratic Acid. And it is very, very powerful antioxidant. And it basically is important in almost every uh, medical application that is available to the Native Americans. Uh, what you see here is this something I, I shot a few years ago in, in the Huhugam uh, Museum on the Pima Reservation. And you will see it's a typical old uh, home of, of that. But you'll notice right here is 
what they call their little shige, which is the, the Pimen word for, uh, for creosote, uh, la rea tridentada. And basically they keep it in their house because they basically have a tea which they prepare every morning uh, that basically beefs up their autoimmune system. Uh, it is a vile tasting uh, conglomeration of, of flavors, but it basically amps up their autoimmune system and the ability for it to act actually as a, an emetic, which means it'll help you regurgitate. It, that was one of the uh, uses of the creosote, but it contains uh, all the compounds that are antibacterial, antifungicidal and antioxidants. And basically what we've used it for is a, is a wide array of cures. Now, I've listed them all here in front of you, but basically the most important thing was uh, it was a pain reliever. It basically uh, affected many of the major uh, diseases and it was used in a decoction form, uh, which is a tea that is boiled to its optimum uh, potency. And it has a lot of powerful uh, ingredients along with NDGA that basically helps eradicate pain. Uh, it, it, the, the, one of the key things that it was used for is actually skin cancer. Pre-melanoma, uh, they actually treated that. And there actually is a German a pharmacist, a pharmaceutical company, that actually has a, a trademark for its use as a deterrent for melanoma kind of uh, diseases. Soap tree yuccas are our next little category. And the, and the key on the soap tree yucca is uh, in, in the root of the plant itself. It contains, as I've indicated earlier, saponins, which, are, which have detergent qualities, will mix with water. And from a ceremonial standpoint, uh, it was used for what I call womb to tomb, uh, which means from birth to death. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the phytochemicals within that root helps to bolster the autoimmune system and reduce bad cholesterol. The polysterol compounds, uh, are anti-inflammatory and are used to treat arthritis. And this is uh, one of the major uses for it by the Native Americans. Our next uh, candidate to be discussed is the mesquite tree. The mesquite tree is probably the most valuable point plant uh, in the Sonoran Desert from a Native American standpoint, mainly because of its food uh, ability to supply good food to Native Americans, but it was a plant that contained many aspects that were needed, construction, uh, medicine, uh, you name it, it was there. And basically what the mesquite tree was used for, all parts of it was used for it medicinally, the leaves uh, for gastrointestinal ailments, uh, leaves that were dried and powdered were used as an eye wash for pink eye and sore eyes. Uh, the, lip, the sap, the black sap, was used for cracked lips, chapped, chapped lips, and it was a wash for open wounds. And the seed pods were used for, to mitigate uh, insect, insect stings. The prickly pear uh, is the next one we'll discuss. And, and basically, that is more of a multi-purpose uh, medicinal plant we can uh, look at all three aspects, treating the symptoms, first aid, and even uh, the basic preventive medicine aspect of it. Uh, in the spring, when you have the immersion of the young pads, uh, they come in with low oxalic acid, uh, and so they can be eaten as a food. Uh, as a food. Uh, the properties within the pads themselves, they have a mucinologenous properties, and they contain amylose, which is a complex uh, carb. And th both of those, uh, along with the fiber content, basically mitigate uh, the glycemic effect relating to type two diabetes. And it also helps to reduce blood pressure by reducing the LDL levels to a, a safe and reasonable level. 
the for first aid applications, the inner flesh of the pad, when you if you had a knife with you and you had all these problems, you would basically take that pad, trim it with your knife, get rid of the spines and the glockets, fillet it, throw it in half, take the poultice, which is that section of the plant facing down with the moist section and could be used for any kind of treatments regarding burns, bites, and stings. Uh, the fruit from the plant uh, contained antioxidants, calcium, and fiber, which obviously was important for your, your preventive med medication. And tea from the flower was used to treat capillary deficiencies, if you're familiar with the fine little red veins that appear on your nose or some of your other spots. This was used to mitigate them. Okay, we're gonna go into a, one of my favorite, my jojoba bush with nuts. The jojoba bush is a dioecious plant. I'm sure most of you guys know that. And basically it's a male and female plant. The female plant has or contains the capsule which has a nut in it. Uh, within that nut, there is a wax, not an oil, because obviously uh, oil would be, from a merchandising standpoint, would be a hard thing to sell to people who are interested in putting wax on their skin. So we, they call it oil, but it's, in essence, it's a very fine, fine wax. The plant itself, the nut itself, uh, was contains uh, the, the wax that is basically sort of like sebum, which is a, uh, a compound that is found within humans, which is a lubricant and acts on the skin and the hair of, of, the, of the body. And, in, and that particular compound has the same effect uh, as sebum does. The ripe seeds were ground up and used to make a coffee-like beverage, but also that same uh, ground up seeds was used to treat uh, topical sores. The green unripened nut was uh, chewed on to mitigate a sore throat. The nut contains simosin, an appetite depressant, which the Native Americans used uh, in any of their major treks uh, to basically mitigate their appetite and keep it from taking over in their mind that they were hungry. Uh, three or four nuts would be sufficient to do it. Anything more than that could cause uh, temporary stops uh, along the way and slowing you down as uh, you grease the skids with too much of that. Uh, the leaf was uh, astringent. And, a, and the tea was used to treat gastrointestinal maladies. Mormon's tea, uh, also known as uh, ephedra, uh, is a gymnosperm. Uh, gymnosperm, we, don't, we have, don't have too many of them, but a gymnosperm is a plant that has an exposed seed just like a fur, this, it has this, this, this. A gymnosperm basically is, is pretty rare commodity in, in the preserve. Uh, the juniper tree is also a juniper, uh, is also a gymnosperm. Uh, and, and so basically its counterpart, an angiosperm, which would mean that is, which is a flowering plant, has seeds within an ovary. And so that is the difference between the the uh, gymnosperm and the angiosperms. Now, Mormon's tea has a cousin in, in China, which is called Mawa, which has been used for thousands and thousands of years to treat uh, the Chinese under their traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, the key element in that uh, plant is, uh, is basically uh, ephedrine, which is a very powerful uh, stimulant. What Mormon's tea has is a pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine is, is a very mild version, a very mild version of the ephedrine that is found in that plant. And basically uh, that plant, 
that plant was used uh, to relieve asthma by inhaling it. It would act as a, a bronchial dilator. Uh, it was used for hay fever and allergies. Uh, it was also used as a pick-me-upper, uh, which would help you if you had a low blood pressure problem, would kick you up a notch. And it was used as a diuretic. Uh, the powdered roots were sprinkled on in sores, and these would, uh, you know, sores which are obviously topically oriented and would basically uh, help mitigate the healing of some of these that were caused by syphilis, but by other uh, kinds of, of sores. Uh, the stems were choose, chewed on to induce saliva flow and to mitigate allergy attacks. So I don't know if some of you have used that, but it does work. And we've used uh, that particular uh, the stems of, of the Mormon's tea to keep the, uh, the moisture in your mouth flowing, but it doesn't add water to your system. White ratney is, uh, is a semi-parasitic. The root is actually, it, it basically it isn't a parasite, but what it does is it takes water away from uh, the plants uh, that are in uh, its vicinity. And it is probably, that root is probably the most astringent root uh, in uh, the preserve. Uh, astringency is basically when uh, the chemical compound will shrink uh, the tissue around it. So obviously uh, it is important in treating uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, starting from any kind of sores in your mouth, all the way down to hemorrhoids on the other side of your tract. Uh, one of the other little things that it was used for was to impact it in the umbil umbilical area of a newborn to keep it in infection free. Now, brittle bush is uh, what we call a missionary plant. I'm sure most of you guys have been out to the Lost Dog Wash and have seen uh, when the season starts, when the flowers are coming up, literally the mountains uh, towards Ancala will turn yellow. And because this is because a missionary plant is some of uh, a plant that will basically take root in a disturbed area such caused by fire, uh, flood, and construction. And basically what we see here is the result of the Ancala fire, which sort of decimated that side of the hill. But there are uh, medicinal benefits to that plant. In spring, when uh, the sap starts running, uh, it can be used by the Native Americans, it was used as uh, as an adhesive for pottery and, and for also attaching, helping attach arrowheads to the shaft. Uh, but it was also used as chewing gum by the kids and it was used as incense uh, in some of the, the churches in the Southwest, uh, which gave it that also the brittle bush the name of incensio. But mainly uh, the sap tears when they harden are gathered by the Native well. Americans, and uh, in combination, they are powdered well. in combination with uh, fat, animal fat, and beeswax. They are rubbed on one's chest and act as a decongestion and expectorant, and ob obviously helps facilitate the elimination of that from your lung area. Uh, it was used for toothaches, and uh, use up, and we talked about incense and chewing gum. Uh, the leaves and the stems have a different property. They have analgesic properties, and with a tea that they prepare, it was used to treat arthritis, tooth and gum pain, and used as a mouthwash for a sore throat. Now, chia is one of my favorites, uh, and again, and mainly because at one time I always associated it with Chia Pet and I thought it had no value, but it turns out to be a, a, a tremendously unique plant. Uh, it is a member of the mint family. It also has a square stem if you were running around in the north and you will see when this thing blossoms, it really does blossom. 
it, it carpets and it's quite a, a thing to see. But the use of this plant as an energy food uh, goes back uh, to the, the Aztecs about 25 or 3,500 years ago. Uh, and the Mayans were involved with it, the Hatarahumara in uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, we're using it. Uh, the Aztecs had used it for forced marches. The Tarahumara basically were are, are still the greatest distance runners in the world. Uh, if you've ever been into the uh, Sierra Madres, you will you will hear and see all major accounts of what they've done uh, in distance running. But the unique thing about Tarahumaras, by the way. Uh, but the unique thing about that is its ability to absorb water and create this mucilaginous or this colloidal suspension of seed and material. Uh, the, it has the ability to absorb 10 times its weight in water, key element, and it obviously prolongs the hydration and maintains uh, an e equal electrolyte balance. But it also creates mucopolysaccharides, which keep the break breaks down the carbohydrate, which slows the breaking down of carbohydrates, and basically helps with the insulin spike. So you have an even, your body is running even. It is the richest plant source for the essential omega-3 fat and fatty acids, acids, but it's also per size. Contains the a, a large spectrum of amino acids, which break down and absorb themselves into the body rapidly. And as they these people are running the distances of hundreds of miles, uh, actually repairing the muscle as they're doing this and keeping their bodies in basic balance. So they're able they're able to go within a 24 period of, hour period of time hundreds, 100, 150 miles or so. One, uh, one provision I should mention about chia seed. Do not, I know many of you have tried it and, and, and have used it. Be very careful that this chia seed is hydrated before you take it. If you take a, a spoonful of this stuff without it being uh, moisturized or having that uh, basically colloidal suspension around it. Uh, you can have problems in your digestive tract uh, because that will start drawing water as it's going down and grow in size. One of the uh, interesting plants in, in our neck of the woods and appears mainly in the north is the desert lavender. Now, lavender has been used uh, Going back to Egyptian times, it was used for the mummification process, also used for perfume, but it really uh, hit its peak uh, with the Romans uh, about 2,500 years ago because they recognized its antiseptic and healing qualities. So in this plant, the flowers and leaves are used. Uh, cold tea basically mitigates stomach distress. And uh, uh, in its hot tea form, it's a, you can inhale it for alleviation of uh, respiratory problems caused by colds and flu. It is a topical hemostat, will stop bleeding, menstrual bleeding, but and hemorrhoidal bleeding also. It is a topical, in topical use, it takes care of tooth and earaches. And aromatically speaking, it has a calming effect. And I'm sure you've seen Many products now are featuring lavender because that is one of its uh, features. It has that. Desert Center has been around for a long, long time. Not as, as known as Center, but the family has. Uh, the leaves and paws are used medicinally, and the tea is a strong laxative. If you've been to a hospital in the last few years and you've had an operation and you have uh, something that happens when we take too much of our opioid, opioid uh, medication, is you develop OIC, opioid, opioid induced constipation. And one of the things you check out in, in the hospital, you get your prescription, is for the use of Senna because 
the, the tea or the product itself is a strong laxative. And, and phytochemically speaking, it inhibits the smooth muscles that retain the stool and stimulates the smooth muscles that push the stool. Okay, so we're gonna go into the home stretch now of, of plants. And the next one is kind of, I've sort of kind of highlighted. I think Steve took a little bit of my thunder away with his opening remarks. But if you have a dog, you have a child, if you have a horse, if you have anybody that's going into the preserve that's young and innocent, uh, I would suggest you make yourself aware of this or make other people aware of this. These are the plants that are basically poisonous in, in our preserve. Uh, the desert tobacco, you won't, you'll find it in the north and you'll find it normally away from the trails. So that is one good, good point. Uh, all parts of this point, plant are poisonous. They contain the toxic, toxic alco, alo, alkaloids, nicotine and anabasine. Uh, they're smoked in pipes for pleasure, medicinal, and ceremonial purposes. They were a painkiller for teeth and earaches. Uh, there's an old expression about blowing smoke, and one of the ways they would do it was actually blow smoke from the tobacco into the ear to mitigate pain. And the crushed leaves were used to soothe as a poultice, to soothe rheumatic and other swellings that appeared on the body. Now, the number one, the number one uh, plant that we started talking about earlier that Steve did and I, and I will, is that I've noticed it uh, since the last time I had been to Brown's Ranch was several months ago, while it was still fairly cool. Uh, and th that plant had not appeared there. And, and what I, when I saw it, I put, made sure I posted it to let people know that, that this plant is one of the 10 deadliest plants in the world, it, and it is, it, it is. So all, point, uh, all plants of this, all parts of this plant are poisonous. And the roots and the leaves are, are the components that are used to make the medicine. Now it contains two powerful alkaloids, atropine, and scopoline. Now, at, uh, atropine, well, you can, whatever, whichever way. Atropine is used if you go to your eye doctor. Uh, it, it is a, a powerful alkaloid that will basically affect the central nervous system. So if you have your eyes dilated, you know that you're being treated with atropine. If you have seasickness, then scopolamine will be the thing that will that you will take on the patch, which will basically get you back into kilter and hopefully eliminate the feeling of seasickness. It was used as a painkiller, an intoxicant, a hallucinogen, especially among uh, shamans. Now it is important. You've got to, with the weather that's been lately. Uh, I have noticed, and many others have noticed, that there is a proliferation of this stuff all over the preserve, especially in the north and near Fraysville and stuff like that. So I think it is important that everyone really focus on this and understand that th th it's there. Touching it can cause problems. Ingesting it will take, take you out. And so uh, basically, we'll leave you with this. Uh, as the end, but not really the end, because there's a postscript to this, okay. A couple of things we, we have to reiterate and talk about is one, uh, no plant material and is shall be or can be removed from the preserve. That will be point number one. Number two, what I am showing you here is the poison garden. And the poison garden uh, is Alwyd Gar Garden in uh, Northumberland, I think, in Northumberland, England. And it's a separate garden uh, that is part of a much larger, gorgeous place. Uh, and it is gated and it is walled. And within it are possibly a hundred some odd plants that can kill you, maim you, and maybe even get you high, uh, but probably end up killing you. Uh, so my point here is this, 
just as uh, someone might put a sign up in the Grand Canyon, uh, no selfies taken here. Uh, we, I got to make this kind of disclosure that plants can be great to cure you. They can taste great, but they can kill you. And it's important that whenever we talk about this, uh, that postscript should be added on uh, strictly to let people know that if you don't know what you're doing, don't mess around with it. So basically, I will end it with that. Uh, and I, I hope we can go back to everybody. And if I'm, it's, I'm open for questions, discussion, points of discussion, things like that, if it's all right with you. Great. Great. Well, Bernie, thank you so thank you. very much. This this will stop the others. Okay. Um, that was very enlightening and very important. Uh, I like your disclaimer at the end. Uh, I, I had no idea that those particular plants were right here in our backyard. Uh, I, I do have a better sense of what ethnobotany means now from your global uh, description uh, prior to uh, starting the Sonoran Desert Park. The other thing is, uh, I never knew, but I'm very, I have motion sickness. And I did wear a scalpeling patch in, uh, the, in Galapagos in order for me to be able to appreciate the five or six days in the open water that we went from island to island. So when I saw <laughs> that, I immediately remembered. And uh, I was a little tired the first day, but it really made the trip much more enjoyable for me. Uh, any oh, questions? I'm glad I did. Yeah, any questions out there? We had one or two from before, but you answered, I think, I think you answered the one about the toxic, toxicity of the, the, the last plant that, how did you pronounce it, the datura? De, de, a sacred datura, no, thorn apple. Oh, they got about local, we, they got a 15 different names for it, but the bottom line is the most important thing is to recognize it and know it when you see it. Uh, one thing about it is that it, it, it lets you know who it is 25, 30 yards away. You can see the large white blossoms, or if you get close enough, you can see the small green apple that has little spikes on it, sort of like the COVID vaccine, you know, the COVID thing. It has those. And uh, yeah, you don't want to touch it. You don't want to nibble on it. it one of the the intrigues about it is that it has an hallucinogen effect on people. It, it has more of a killing effect, but the, some of the shamans actually partook in that, uh, the, that situation. They actually uh, tried it. And obviously sh there's a shaman boot hill where there, there's a whole bunch of shamans that are buried because they never made it. But, uh, but the, the, the Native Americans or any of the indigenous people, there's always been a need for, for humans to sort of transcend into another dimension. And I, I think if they found, I think there's a, well, I forgot which book it is. Uh, it's the something, the botany of desire. That's it. And marijuana is one of the things that humans have worked to actually help facilitate that plant in in the world and I, I might have missed it but what actually happens if you touch it what what happens to you well it look it's like anything else it's like it depends on who you are i mean what happens if you eat a peanut i don't know i love peanut butter i love peanuts maybe some kid will have a peanut and and will go into into shock and it, it, no it depends i i really you could get you can get some kind of reaction to it. I really don't know, but if you ingest it or you know that kind of thing, in some cases, even if you smell it, uh, you can get nailed. Uh, and in the garden, uh, in the poison garden in Ellen, uh, they definitely try to keep you out uh, when certain plants are pollinating because that's in the air. Uh, and you see when they, they have guys going in there with hazmat suits working on the garden. Uh, it, it, plants are interesting. Plants go back. 
I mean, historically to the Medici's and you, know, you can talk about Socrates with Hemlock. I mean, we go back a long time in, in, in working with plants that can kill you and they're still being used. Ricin is deadly. I mean, I mean, there's so many things out there, but m most importantly, it's, it's important to know what in the preserve uh, can be injurious to your health or your pet's health probably a horse or dog or things like that, or a kid that might just run off and say, oh, look at this little blossom and then play around with it and do something. What, what about, um, someone's asking about mushrooms. Do we have a lot of mushrooms in the desert? I don't see them that often. Oh, well, yeah, we have mushrooms, but uh, yeah, I mean, they do come up on, when the conditions are right. Uh, I don't really, I'm not a mushroom, a fungi man. I don't really know too much about them. <laughs> Uh, as far as the toxicity, I, I don't know. Um, they're edible or they're deadly. Uh, pick your choice. What the bottom line is, if you better know before you stick something in your mouth what it is. I mean, if you want to be an explorer, good luck. Uh, you can do that, but I would say take stay away from it. Thank you so much. We're all explorers and we appreciate the information and uh, it's great for pathfinders to know at the trailheads to be able to convey that message. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, Steve, and I, I'm sorry about that outage. I don't know what happened. You oh, know me, listen, I'm, a, I'm a great tech man. I love I loved the, uh, well, it was part of the program. They were smoking joints on the way down, so it's medicinal. Oh, well, yeah, well, I actually ran out and got one, but no, just okay. kidding. No. Okay, everybody. Well, thank no, you. I, yeah. I, I, hey, is, you know what? Let me just say, it's good to see all you people. It is. You yeah, too, Bernie. You. Yeah. God, well, thank you. you doing? Thank you, Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. Program. My pleasure. Nice My pleasure. You, Enjoyed it. See you on the trails. May the Schwartz be with you. Okay. <laughs>